In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. I really like monarchs. I find them really fascinating. They have such an impact on the world, you know. It, but I'm not talking about the, the butterfly, which I'm sure you're expecting to. That's that's next week's sermon. <laughs> We're talking about kings, of course, being that it is Christ the King Sunday. The last Sunday, a uh, normal time before Advent, is shockingly somehow next week. Like myself, I'm sure many of us have a certain fascination with the, the royal family, Queen Elizabeth, the lovely lady, but despite her curiosity, I know for myself that I still have a slight preference for democracy and not for time. I think Mark Twain's Huck Very Thin puts it well. When Huck is talking to Jim, he says, All I say is, kings is kings, and you got to make allowances. Take them all around, they're a mighty, ordinary lot. It's the way they're raised. I think ordinary is something of an understatement for certain kings of our, of our history, of the world's history. It doesn't take long to think of numerous examples of less than ideal characters. Think of Ivan the Terrible, who has the moniker, moniker attached to his name, who tortured people just for fun. Or Montezuma, who captured all these you know, people just to make human sacrifices. Not great people. You could think of in the Bible, King Herod, and then the Pharaoh trying to kill all these little boys just to try to, to eliminate just the one in Moses and then in Christ. But this idea of kings, well, it has sort of a tempestuous history, if you will. And if you think of how Israel got to the point of having a king, it wasn't really God's idea. It was the people who demanded it over and over. They thought it would be the coolest thing. They thought that it would make them just like all the rest. And the prophet Samuel warned them of the, the danger of having a king. He says, he will take your sons for soldiers, make your daughters slaves, he will tax you. Take your grain and cattle, and the day will come when you pray that you will be delivered from kings. And then Samuel makes another point, which is poignant to us. You already have a king in God the Father. The, the Lord is already a king. But still the people cry out and they say, hey, we want to be like the other guys. We want a king. And then we jump forward in today's reading to Ezekiel, and we see kind of what has happened. The day has come after centuries of corrupt and greedy and, again, less than ideal kings. We come to the destruction of Israel and Babylonian captivity, and God steps in and says, All right, guys, I will rescue you from this. Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. And that is a simple prophecy that is so beautiful because it, it perfectly describes what happens with Christ's arrival. When God himself comes in flesh asserting his rule and authority over his people. The gospel itself is clear about a lot of things, but of two particular things when it comes to Christ. First, we hear explicitly that, that Jesus is a king and a descendant of the house of David. And the second is that he was a king unlike any other kings. He was born in royal David city in Bethlehem, but he was born in a stable instead of a palace with no place to lay his head. He didn't have the same triumphant accession to the throne like many kings. His accession to the throne was his entry into Jerusalem in the royal capital place. He came riding on a donkey, not exactly the same fanfare as other kings would demand. His own royal garment, if you will, was a dirty purple rag. His royal crown made of thorns. His scepter, a reed of palms. He made his royal procession weak and bleeding through the streets. The people jeering instead of cheering. And then finally in Calvary, he's enthroned upon a cross. When we look at Christ's life as a whole, from, from birth to death and to resurrection, Jesus is mocking 
the earthly kings. He came innocently to serve and not to conquer with other people's blood, only his own. Under his rule as king, everyone is a servant. There are no masters because even the king came to serve and not to be served. The greatest members of the kingdom are the least. The reward for service is not great promotion or reward or elevation of status, but it is more opportunities to serve. The mighty are cast from their thrones, while the lowly are exalted. The lowest are highest. The tax collectors and other unseemly characters will get into the kingdom before the hypocritical Pharisees. That is Christ's kingdom. Our challenge to live into, the, live into this is that we simultaneously live in two kingdoms. We have this world that we see all around us, and then that of Christ. I mean, it's somewhat reminiscent, reminiscent of, of the parable of giving under, uh, giving due what is Caesar, that is due Caesar, and then giving to Christ what is Christ. And that, that makes some sense of how we kind of balance the two but well, there's a danger in how we fully express this and live this out. There's a danger or a concern to sort of combine and blur the lines of the two. We might, you know, associate or have some sort of amalgamation of conservative, generally like good morals, and that's what being a Christian is. And fortunately, a lot of that does match up, but not all of it. Might we, like the Israelites before, want to be like the other nations or the rest of the world? It's easier to fit in, to shape our lives, and to sort of adapt our lives to what is around us. Well, then how do we accept Christ's challenge that is depicted in the Gospel here? How do we live into caring for all those around us? Ezekiel this morning writes, I will feed them with justice, says the Lord God. Justice. It's one of the most important things that sets Christ's rule apart is justice, but it's a different manner of justice than many of us are perhaps used to. For it's not the justice that we deserve, but the opposite. When thinking of the gospel, Jesus has very high standards for us. How do we match up? Throughout Jesus' life, he puts such an emphasis upon forgiveness, and that's the crux. It is forgiveness that is informed by, by compassion and charity and patience that measures the justice. Christ paints a picture that people, those that are, are at ease and are at home in the kingdom, they are the ones who are ready to forgive. They are the people who feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty. They welcome strangers, they clothe the naked, they visit the sick and imprisoned, they love and they forgive. This, this follows Christ's own example, who is a king like no other. He is a servant to all. When we see our own depiction of a perfect and good king, we stand and look at him in glory. The Christus Rex, he's depicted with a royal crown of gold, not of thorns. His robes are silk and radiant. But this is just a glimpse of the full majesty that, of, of the majesty that comes at the end time. We, we can draw on his life and his word, his kingly power by faith. And we exercise it by love and we hope to share in it and see our king face to face. May Christ reign forever in our hearts.